the United States carried out two airstrikes uh, against facilities used by the Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. Now, this was this wasn't just a strike on proxies. This was a strike on Iran because they utilized these two facilities inside uh, Syria. So they were in eastern Syria early Friday. It's a retaliation for the recent rocket activity, which has gone against American forces in both Iraq and in Syria. The strikes were carried out by Air Force Air uh, F-16s against a weapon storage facility, again, controlled by the national, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, uh, as well as an ammunition storage facility. Uh, the idea here, and th- I think you got to put this in, in context with the fact that we have in the region right now two massive naval carrier groups. So the United States is trying to send a message here uh, globally, but most uh, most importantly right now, Andy, regionally. U.S. has Gerald Ford. The U.S. has Dwight Eisenhower. The Eisenhower is in the Persian Gulf. The, Gulf, the Ford is in the eastern Mediterranean. There are a variety of destroyers and, Amer- and American ships there. And the uh, statement that was made by uh, Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, is that, look, these are not... Uh, these are strikes that are being made just because we have to defend our uh, troops there. There are 2,500 U.S. troops in Iraq and 900 in Syria helping local uh, counterterrorism missions against the Islamic State. And this is a retaliation uh, against the Iranian-linked groups, as Jay said, for attacks on U.S. forces. Look, Hamas and Hamas leadership and the Ayatollahs are meeting with the Russians. Here's a book I did a couple of years ago, called Unholy Alliance. The picture on the cover is the Ayatollah with uh, Vladimir Putin. This is the world we're living in. And this was about six years ago. This is the world we're living in right now. And we, I talked about that right now. I said it's the agenda for Iran, Russia, and jihadists for uh, world conquest. And that's what it is. So the United States, I think, is sending a very strong and important message. Uh, and I think, I think President Biden was right, and we should be supporting our troops as they engage in this. But make no mistake, this was and this is a going to fit into the geopolitical situation and the military situation in the Middle East. This is not tied. What happened in the United States' action last night was not tied to what is happening in Gaza with Hamas. This is an attack uh, by, this is a an action by the United States to protect our own troops. Professor Dershowitz, I want to start with, um, you were at Harvard for a long time. You've been an emer- you're emeritus professor now. We're, we're getting calls from Jewish students all over the country, and some Christian Zionist students as well, that the harassment they're having on campus is is unprecedented. What What's your sense of what has happened here? It used to be these campuses were the bastion for free speech and the marketplace of ideas. That's what the Supreme Court used to call it. But we're in a whole, it seems like a whole different world right now. Well, they've never been a bastion of free speech. In the 1930s, um, in Harvard, uh, Nazis were welcome. Uh, The school sent the delegation to a Nazi university that just fired all of its Jews. Harvard has had anti-Jewish, anti-Catholic quotas uh, for many, many years. So obviously things have gotten much, much, much worse. There's a whole commission set up to make sure that they continue to coddle these students. These are 33 student groups uh, that uh, that that blame uh, on the day after, even before Israel did anything, uh, they blame the rape, the murders, the beheadings on the Jews and on Israel. And I have, as an emeritus professor at Harvard, still associated with the university, I have demanded that the university publish the names of the students in these groups that have blamed these rapes on Israel. And as the result of me and others calling for the naming of these students, Harvard instead has said, no, we're gonna provide services to help the students protect their anonymity. You know, you're, you're an expert on the First Amendment, as am I. There's nothing in the First Amendment that protects the right of somebody to call for the murder and the rape of people and then hide behind their organization and refuse to uh, disclose their names. This isn't doxing. We're not talking about disclosing people's sexual orientation or where they live. We're talking about these are people who defended the rape, the murder, and the beheading of people publicly. And we want to know their names so that employers can know if they want to hire, as for example, young lawyers people who support rape. Uh, You're a lawyer. Would you want any of your clients to have imposed on them a lawyer uh, who defends rape and beheadings? Of course not. We have a right to know that. So I'm in a big fight with Harvard about that. I'm on the side of the First Amendment, not on the side of coddling 
these adults. Professor Dershowitz has really articulated the situation that exists in the Middle East and in Israel very well, and he has spoken very eloquently and strongly and powerfully regarding this idea that there is an undercore of anti-Semitism that lies there, and strike a Zionist and you'll find uh, you an anti-Zionist and you're going to find an anti-Semite, I think is what he said, Jay. And I think he's absolutely correct on that. And he also another thing I just want to emphasize is that this is not just an attack on Israel. It's an attack also on Christianity. Iran's foreign minister accused the U.S. of directing Israel's war. That's what they've been accusing, uh, and that's the, against Hamas. So you now have, though, meetings taking place at the highest level between Russia hosting Hamas and Iran for meetings in Moscow. I mean, I want you to think about this for a moment. In Moscow, right now, meetings between Russia, Iran, and Hamas. So there's your new alignment. When you talk about real politic, there's your alignment. And, of course, China, not just in the shadows or not just in the backgrounds, but China, of course, an active part of this too. Remember, it was just last week that Putin was with Xi. So you look at all of this, Andy, and you say to yourself, we've got a new geopolitical uh, conglomeration coming here that's got unbelievable repercussions. What you have is another axis. If you study World War II, you had the Berlin, Tokyo axis and Rome axis. And this was an axis that ran from Germany through Italy and to Japan. You are now having another axis of evil that is forming. You have the Chinese, you have the Russians, and you have Hamas getting together and spearheading actions that against Israel that uh, are ultimately intended to be against the United States. Think of this, the foreign minister of Iran standing on United States soil in the United Nations in New York saying to the United States, you won't be spared to say that to us. You won't be spared if the Israel-Hamas war spreads. What kind of an incitement is that for him to be making to us in the United States? And I want to see a reaction from the president of the United States to something like that that is more than just uh, uh, words. I want to see actions taken when the Iranian foreign minister can stand on U.S. soil and make that kind of a threat. You've got to understand something. When you got Hamas meeting with Russia, Iran meeting with Russia, and it's all taking place in Moscow, and nothing good is coming out of this new axis of evil. It absolutely is not. And this is a new axis of evil that's mirroring the axis of evil that we had in World War II. Now Moscow, ever ready to take a position against the United States, ever ready to do anything that undermines American interests, including our liaison, our close ties with Israel in the Middle East, is now saying, come to Moscow and let's sit down together and figure out what we can do. I just got this from the, the team I'm working with in Israel, that a massive Israeli invasion of Gaza is beginning now. They're calling this Israel's D-Day. Uh, this, look, we knew this had to happen. The hostages had not been released. They released four. You can't let this sit, sit forever. I, I hate it for the hostage situation. We're still working aggressively on this, folks. Believe me, the ACLJ is fully involved on this. But, Andy, here you go. It was inevitable. I think that uh, there was peace. The Hamas broke that peace. They broke it in a horrible, horrific, inhumane, barbaric manner by murdering people, by cutting their heads off. The, Israel, the is, Israeli forces, the defense forces, had to respond. And now, finally, we have to take that D-Day step. June 6, 1944 has become October 27, 2023. Yep. We will, another day that will go down in history. Yeah, it's already been a major conflict, but it's going to increase drastically, folks. So be praying for... Our leaders, including the president, uh, our secretary of defense, pray for the leadership in Israel from all of the different parties. Pray for those soldiers, both the U.S. soldiers and the Israeli soldiers that are now on the front lines of this. Pray for our Navy who's in the region. There's a lot to be praying for.